Uh, okay, advertising uh, to be sort of the central focus tonight. <coughs> uh, this, of course, touches on the competition monopoly thing, but I'm going to try to focus on the advertising aspect of it. Advertising has always had a very, very bad press in economics textbooks and treatises and so forth. Only within the last couple of years has there been any kind of a re-evaluation of advertising. Even that is pretty grudging, I'll tell you that. Uh, <coughs> One thing is advertising is supposed to be wasteful, it's supposed to be a waste of resources, it's supposed to be monopolistic, and it's supposed to somehow determine the consumers. In other words, the advertising, you look at the ad, and somehow it sets up a, some kind of a button in your head, and it determines you to rush off and buy the product. These are sort of, the, I guess, the three basic charges against uh, advertising. The thing about being wasteful stems from a, a topic which I'll return to with great love and affection later. The, the so-called perfect competition model, or the pure competition model. One of the kookiest, uh, most peculiar, most bizarre theories has ever, has ever come to dominate economic thought. And really still does, and get right down to it. Um, the perfect competition model is a model which, which was given to us by Frank Knight, <coughs> founder of the so-called Chicago School, in 1921. Uh, and, <coughs> The perfect competition model is supposed to be, as, as the name perfect implies, obviously. If you, use a, if you use the word perfect, you're already using a, a very value-loaded term. Or off the word pure, in other words, another alternative word, it's also, it's also value-loaded. Obviously, everybody's in favor of purity and perfection. Uh, a pure perfect competition model assumes that uh, the only real competition, the only fru fruitful competition, the ideal kind of competition, the only competition worth the name, is the competition that exists when every firm in the industry is so small, so teeny, so minuscule, that nothing it does has any effect whatsoever on the price, on the product, on nothing. This is, per this is perfect competition, or this is pure competition, I should say, I mean, uh, more specific. Pure competition is that, where everything is Every firm in the industry is atomistical, at atomically small, and therefore has no impact on anything. Uh, perfect competition is pure competition, all of that, plus, plus perfect knowledge on the part of everybody. I swear, I swear, everybody on the market knows everything. All consumers know everything about the, everything about what's going on. All products, all prices, they know, they're, they're born somehow with this information in their head. And all producers know everything. All, all businessmen know what their costs are, they know what the demand is. It's all there. And, and you see, it's, it's given on the textbook. You open the page of the textbook, there it is. They've got the demand curve, they've got the cost curve. What else do you want? Uh, it's, all, it's all given. <clears throat> so the, so the uh, assumption is that perfect competition is somehow realistic and better and terrific and wonderful. And anything, and then you see what these people do, they look around at the world. And they look around. They say, "They see that things are not are not like perfect competition. Firms are too big. They're big enough to affect their price or their product. <clears throat> they're not teeny. They're not microscopically small. And you don't have perfect competition. You have a lot of people who don't know what's going on. Like most people don't know what's going on. <laughs> <coughs> and nobody knows the future. And incidentally, perfect knowledge also means perfect knowledge of the future. Obviously, it means that you know what future prices are going to be." And it's up to the indefinite future, and future demands, and future costs. It's, it's total insanity. There's no question about it. But this is the assumption. Now, what happened was that Frank Knight and the Chicago School, really the original Chicago School, set up this perfect competition model, except they assumed this is, this is the way things were, more or less. The few deviations which are unimportant. The, the model, by the way, of course, is the 19th century wheat farm. Hiram Jones, Iowa wheat farmer, now, whatever he does, within reason, it doesn't, it's not going to affect the wheat market terribly much. Uh, although, see, philosophically, it's still not true, because if the angel Gabriel came down to him and gave him some magic formula for multiplying his wheat by two million times, he'd have an effect on the market all right. And his so-called horizontal demand curve would bend a bit. <laughs> so even there, the <coughs> it's not true. But here, the peculiar thing is that in the 19th century, 19th century economists were much more realistic when they talked about competition. They didn't assume perfect competition. They were living in an agricultural so-called era. They didn't assume perfect competition or teeny wheat farms. But, uh, but 
the, the, the pure competition model comes in in the early 20th century just when the whole wheat farm model is going out the window. Because it is obviously irrelevant. At any rate, so the, the Frank Knight people uh, assumed the perfect competition, pure competition, was more pretty realistic. And this is what competition is and was, and this is great, and so forth and so on. And then in the early 30s, uh, Chamberlain and Robinson independently, <coughs> uh, Edward Chamberlain, one of the most famous PhD theses ever written, uh, and Robinson both coming out of their thing in the same year, 1933. Uh, Essentially, said, and I said, we'll get back to this when we get to the monopoly competition proper. But essentially, they said, hey, wait a minute, this is not the way things are. <clears throat> the world is not like this. You don't have uh, teeny wheat farms, and every time a, a firm does something, it influences its price and influences its market. Every firm faces a falling demand curve, and there's differentiated product. You don't have every, because that's part of pure, pure competition. You have two million firms in every industry, each one of which is producing identically the same product. If you differentiate product, it means it's evil monopoly. See, because the thing is that if you're if you're uh, if you're if you're uh, Wonder Bread, you're producing a bread which is pretty similar to Tip Top and Silver Cup, but it's still different, so different. The person like myself can love it. Uh, then you see this is being monopolistic because only Wonder Bread can, can produce Wonder Bread. Nobody else can get into this, can horn in on this on this on this um, area of private decision. So, so the, what Chamberlain and Robinson did is they said, wait a minute, this is not the way the world is. The market isn't like this. The market is far from perfect and far from pure, and therefore it's monopolistic, and therefore it's evil, and therefore it's impure, and therefore the government has to go and come in and smash it in some way. Now the point is that the, that the Chamberlain and Robinson, I don't really blame the Chamberlain and Robinson people, because they were working within the matrix that had been accepted by that time by Orthodox economics, <coughs> Frank Knight. These people having imposed it sort of on, uh, on an orthodox economic. And they, they accepted the perfect competition model as being the proper one and the, and the best thing to happen and so forth and so on. And without considering it was totally absurd, unrealistic, and be bad if we had it, seems to me pretty, almost self evident. At any rate, uh, they said, well, look, we haven't got it, we're far from it, and therefore the market is evil and we have to do something about it. And it seems to me this is almost as follows. I don't really blame them as much as I blame the original perfect competition model builders. At any rate, getting to the advertising end of this, uh, if the man curves are given, if you've got perfect knowledge, if consumers know everything, if all consumers know everything automatically, and all producers know everything automatically, of course advertising is wasteful. And nobody is right mind would advertise. If all of us had ESP, if I knew what Macy's sale was going to be tomorrow, without having to look at the paper, you just sort of automatically know that Macy's going to sell you know, uh, toothpaste for such and such a, 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 a tube, be no point in Macy's advertising. Then, of course, it would be wasteful, and they'd know it, and they wouldn't advertise. And of course, the point is, we ain't omniscient, we haven't got perfect knowledge, and we have to, in order to find out what Macy's going to do tomorrow, we have to read about it some way. Somebody, somebody's got to inform us of it. This is called, quote, advertising, unquote. But the assumption of waste only follows from the insane, bizarre, and absurd assumption of perfect competition, of perfect knowledge, of the idea that somehow people know everything to begin with. They don't have to learn, and learning takes time and effort, and somebody's got to tell them, and somebody's, there's a whole industry, a whole information industry uh, built around this. Uh, and so, incidentally, well, the whole idea of differentiated product, uh, I will get back to, too. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, this is one of my pet peeves about differentiated products. The assumption on the part of most economists that when a product is differentiated between, between brands, that somehow this, this differentiation is artificial, evil, and imposed upon the consumer by some kind of brainwash. I, I will say I'll return to this, but I want to say flatly right now, I'm not being brainwashed when I say that Wonder Bread is, to me, is better than tasty bread. It has nothing to do with advertising or pretty girls being advertised on the commercial or anything of that sort, I just like to taste better. Okay, to return. Uh, actually, advertising, again, you see, the, the demand curve, remember we have the, the given demand curve, unquote, given everybody automatically. Also, the demand curve for what is the next question, the demand curve for the product. The product is also given. In this, in this never, never land of orthodox microeconomics, 
products are given, so nobody has to develop any new ones. I mean, they're there, they're there, that's all. I mean, Wonder Bread somehow drops down from the sky, I thought they, somebody started selling it. No Mr. Wonder ever, <laughs> ever sat down and thought of the idea of Wonder Bread. No, no, nothing ever gets created new. So the whole problem of innovation then comes into the picture. And actually, this is Jules Backman's empirical studies in advertising, and which products advertise more than others. The products that advertise more than others, others, for example, and this is a very common sense kind of thing, are new products. In other words, Wonder Bread, all right, you advertise a certain amount. Basically, people have heard of it, but how about a new product coming in? Uh, perfumes, for example, is a very high death rate of perfumes. Very high turnover. <coughs> new perfume comes on, comes on. You have to have, you have to inform the, the public that it's there. Uh, my peccadillo, whatever the name of the perfume is. You have to inform them that it's there somehow. Inform the, inform the public with high qualities, or what you think high qualities are, cause of their attention. Uh, so that therefore, in the first couple of, in, in any product, in the first couple of years of a new product, has the highest percentage of advertising. Then when it gets established, it wins its market, the percentage of uh, advertising usually falls off. So you have to inform people of a new product. You also, by the way, have to inform them, uh, <coughs> even if it's not new, you have, to, you have to inform the new generation coming up. There's a new generation of kiddies coming up who might, not, may, might never have heard of Wonder Bread, for example. They have to be informed of it. And you have to remind the oldsters, because people, don't have, people do not have uh, infallible memories. They might forget somehow about Wonder Bread, even though to me it's quite unlikely. But others who are not Wonder Bread fanatics, they might forget, forget, they might walk down the street one day and, and buy some other bread, unbeknownst, not having remembered about Wonder Bread, so they have to be reinformed, reminded of the situation, of the existence of this product. Okay, I'll get back to that too. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, actually, as just as new products are obviously need a lot of advertising, advertising is an extremely important form of competition, rather than being a form of monopoly, and again, the reason, incidentally, why it's supposed to be a form of monopoly, according to the textbooks, is because, by definition, all products are uniform. And therefore, any differentiation, differentiation of products within a, an industry, within a broad field, a broadly defined industry, any differentiated product is somehow monopolistic. But in actual practice, when products are differentiated, when there is a difference between Wonder Bread and, and, and AC Bread, etc., then... Uh, Advertising becomes a form of competition, a form of competing with your rival, and part of the way you restrict competition is to outlaw uh, advertising. Uh, now, for example, this is done in, uh, in several fields, uh, e.g., uh, the medical profession we've already talked about. One of the ways in which medical competition is restricted between doctors is the so-called ethics, so-called eth medical ethics, which says to each doctor it's, it's it's nasty to advertise. It's nasty to put up a big sign in front of your building, so forth and so on. A little sign is alright, but a big sign. Oh, good. <laughs> <coughs> now, this, this form of restricting advertising is a form of restricting competition. Similar to this, even more blatant, are the laws in, in many states, laws in many states prohibiting pharmacists from putting up signs in the, in the store advertising or listing the price of their prescription drugs. <coughs> Here's an interesting point. Uh, pharmacists are prohibited by law from having a sign up saying they can do it for non-prescription drugs, where they haven't got this tight monopoly. They can do it for vitamin pills, they can do it for, for hairspray and stuff like that. They can have a sign up in the store saying 35 cents for such and such. They can't do it for penicillin, they can't do it for other prescription drugs. The reason is that that would be a form of competition, obviously. If the public knew, the poor schnooky public, you need your penicillin fix. You go to your friendly neighborhood drugstore. If you could shop around a bit <coughs> by going to three or four drugstores and finding out what the price is as listed, uh, then you might then the price would come down from what it is now. This this way, since advertising is this form of listing, advertising listing prices is a form of advertising. Obviously, it's a form that most people don't attack too much, and they don't realize it's advertising. The listing of prices in the store and the window just as much advertising, calling attention to the public of. of your product and what the price is, just as much advertising as, uh, as getting commercial on television. Also cheaper, of course. But the, and so the, this outlawing of this is a method by which, as, as my friend Yale Brosen pointed out, is a method by which 
uh, competition can be uh, made in the drug industry, and outlawing is a method by which this, is, this competition is restricted. Uh, oh boy, I could go into the pharmacy business. It's another, <laughs> another hot one. <coughs> uh, okay, also in economics, in economic theory, a big distinction is made all the time. This is part of the whole uh, competition monopoly thing, too. The big distinction is made between, quote, production costs, unquote, and, quote, selling costs, unquote. The assumption is that pr production costs is okay. That's legitimate. I mean, after all, you have to spend it, pay money. You have to pay out money in order to produce something. <clears throat> so that costs something. It costs a certain amount of money to make a high five set. That's okay. What's not okay, what's illegitimate, wasteful, evil, monopolistic, now you name the pejorative term, what's not okay is selling costs, meaning getting these, <laughs> getting these damn high five sets out from your warehouse and into the hands of the public. Anything of that sort, advertising, listing of price, uh, marketing, direct mail, any of these things are selling costs, somehow this is illegitimate. <clears throat> Why is it illegitimate? One of the reasons, there are several reasons I've already mentioned. One of the reasons is, according to economic theory, that <clears throat> production cost is, is okay because you're doing it to, you're incurring these production costs in order to fulfill your demand curve, to meet the demand curve. Like the demand curve is there, and you're there, you're, there's a demand for high price stuff, and you're, the, you're, you're incurring costs in order, to, in order to meet the demand. But selling costs are evil because the guy who's incurring it is trying to increase his demand curve, trying to push it upward by satisfying the consumer better. The problem with this is that that's what production costs are. I mean, for heaven's sake, if you have a, supposing you're making a high price set, you've made everything except the speaker, and you don't have the speaker yet, well, that's, you know, then you put the speaker in, what are you doing? You're raising the demand curve for the product. <laughs> Without the speaker, the demand curve is a lot lower. <laughs> Push the demand curve up by adding a speaker. Uh, if you polish the, the, polish the surface, put a mahogany surface on your, that's a, that's a production cost, Technically, you're raising the demand curve. That's what's, that's what's wrong with that? That's what, that's what the whole shouting match is all about. But the, the idea of production, the idea of being in business is trying to get, get your demand curve as high as possible for your product, uh, as large a market as possible. There's no difference between selling costs and production costs. It's a phony, totally phony distinction. I say all production costs are trying to raise your demand curve from zero. You start with nothing, you have nothing demand for it. Zero demand for nothing. And as you keep adding stuff, you're raising your demand curve. Uh, <laughs> of course, the, the, techno, the, techno, the technical, physical thing, the, the high five set, is not going to do the consumer any good if it's 500 miles away in a warehouse. It's somehow got to be transported, it's got to be called to the attention of the consumer, and so forth and so on. Another point which my uh, late mentor, Professor Mises, I used to talk about, is the artificial distinction between production costs and selling costs, is if you take a package, of any product, and you wrap a nice ribbon around it, a nice red, red ribbon, this is the production cost and supposedly legitimate. The other half, you take that ribbon and you hang it on the store in which you're selling a product, this is evil, that's a, that's a selling cost and therefore illegitimate. Because uh, it's not part of a physical product, you see. Now this, uh, <coughs> this brings me to another point about physical product. It used to be said back in the 19th century, in the, in the days of classical economics, that uh, <clears throat> consumers, are, in many cases, are irrational. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff in economics through, through history about the so-called irrationality of consumers. One of the reasons it's supposed to be ir irrational. This is sort of stuff John Stuart Mill, was rather Victorian type, anyway. Of course, used to say, is that well, <laughs> people are willing to pay a higher price for a certain product <clears throat> in one in one store than they are in another store. Somehow, they're willing to pay more. Uh, around the corner than they are somewhere else. And it seems to be irrational. Why aren't they insisting on, you know, shopping around for a cheaper price? Well, there are many, there are many reasons why a physical product might not have the same price in different places. In the first place, location might be better. I might be willing to pay 10 cents more for the same product around the corner than schlepping downtown and paying 70 cents, <laughs> uh, a fare to get the same product. Obviously, location cost comes into the picture. But even more, this is, this is uh, more relevant to the, <coughs> the physical product, the uh, production cost, selling cost distinction. Even more than that, there's more when you're buying something, you're not just buying a physical object, you're also buying, possibly, the whole ambiance that goes with it. The service, the, 
the whole, the whole atmosphere. This is all part of the, of the package the consumer is buying. Now, to John Stewart Mill, this might appear irrational, but to the others of us, it might appear very rational. For example, supposing you're buying vanilla ice cream at uh, the Lutes <laughs> or at the at, at Nedix, <clears throat> to take the two ends of the socio-restaurant spectrum. Now, let's assume for a minute, it'll probably be better ice cream Lutes, no question about it. Let's assume for a minute it's the same damn ice cream. As many, as many left-wing anti-market types will say, it's the same thing, it's the same aspirin, but you know, they, they just put a different brand on it. Let's assume for a minute that the same ice cream, bought, both of which were bought from Briars or whatever, and, and uh, but Lutetsa cost $2 a plate or whatever for this, <coughs> <coughs> this ice cream, and Edith would cost 20, 20 cents. Now the question is, is, is it irrational to go into Lutetsa and just, just to eat this, eat this ice cream instead of eating the same ice cream for a much cheaper rate? No, it isn't. Because of Lutetsa, you're getting not just the physical ice cream, you're also getting much higher quality uh, service, a much much prettier restaurant. Uh, you're getting uh, uh, you're getting fawning service instead of service thrown at you uh, with disdain and contempt. Uh, you're getting more pleasant atmosphere. You're getting the possibility or the probability of seeing John Lindsay at the next table or whatever. <laughs> Those who like that sort of thing, <laughs> pay for it. Uh, <clears throat> you're getting all these things, all these associations and and services, so intangible services, which are wrapped up in eating a little test. Which are, which are ir- unrelated, really, or, or, or not the same, uh, not, not simply the physical item that you're actually eating. <clears throat> and you're willing to pay, people are willing to pay for that, obviously, they're willing to pay for that. And to say this is irrational is simply not seeing as a, a physical object is not the only thing that's being purchased. Uh, as I say, it's also the atmosphere, the service, the uh, external effects, as we call it, and so forth. The ambiance. <coughs> uh, <coughs> getting, getting back to the differentiated product now, there is this notion, as I say, uh, which come, came in with Chamberlain and Robertson uh, very heavily, <coughs> that in the broad industry, and it's broad, in this industry is not defined too clearly, but industry, let's, let's like take a common sense definition, that any differentiated product within that industry, any brand name, is really artificial. It's differentiated only by advertising, by cunning on the part of the producer, by brainwashing. But they're really all the same. In other words, the assumption is they're really all the same thing. And they're socking the consumer more because they're, they're paying more for it. <coughs> and you have this brand loyalty which has been induced. <coughs> uh, but the assumption is that the products are really the same and the public, the consumers think they're different. My contention is, and this is a contention I first discovered in Lawrence Abbott's very interesting book called Quality and Competition, which I commend to everybody. My contention is that really the facts are really just the opposite that <clears throat> what's really going on is the consumers don't know the, the differences that do exist. In other words, that the differences that exist are even greater than consumers think there, there are. Because see, we don't know any, when you don't know anything about a field, here we get to the whole concept, which economics books never talk about, a concept of learning to consume. Consumption is not just a, not just sort of a reflex action, it's a, it's a cultural value thing which you learn how to do. As you learn about different areas of consumption, just, just like you learn about areas, different areas of study and discipline, you learn about differences. First, see, when you first start out, for example, supposing you thought you don't know anything about wine, and you start out, and all wine seems the same, it's all the same junk, right? Red, white, white doesn't make any difference. It's all, it's all terrible, and it all tastes the same, it's all the same stuff. That's the, your initial reaction. Well, some people always have this reaction. Others, as they keep on, start learning more about wines, and, and this wine is different, they can then separate, separate, and if they get, <clears throat> far enough into the field, they can tell you which vineyard it came from, which slope of which vineyard, and what year, <laughs> all that. And the point is, <clears throat> so all these fantastic differences between wines, most people don't care about the difference, therefore don't see it and don't evaluate it, but the point is the differences are really there. Rather than differences being artificial, differences are really there, and the consumers, as they find out more about the topic, more about the area, discover these differences more and more as they go on. So rather than Brand names being artificially different, they're very, they're right on target. Uh, to say, for example, the New York State Champagne is exactly the same thing as French Champagne is absurd. Anybody knows anything about Champagne. It's not an diff- artificially differentiated product. And it goes for every area of consumption. It goes for music. It goes for uh, you know, some area of music. First, you think it's all noise. 
Then as you start consuming more of it, you see all sorts of differences and differences between composers, differences between players, et cetera, et cetera. And you learn more and more about differences all the time. Same way about baseball. Somebody doesn't know anything about baseball, thinks that all baseball players are the same. It's all the same junk, just that they're waving a bat. As you learn more about it, you find out there's an enormous difference between Willie Stargell and the kid around the block. And so forth and so on. <clears throat> now the interesting thing is, that people like Galbraith, who's a, who's a fantastic snob in this area, uh, <clears throat> always says that everything which the masses buy, you see, is it's all the same stuff. It's all differenti- artificially differentiated. What he buys, of course, is all very subtly discriminating and different. He would never say, for example, that his economics book is the same as all other economics books. I mean, why, why not say that? All textbooks are the same, all economics books are the same, it's all the same junk, and that's it. As you learn more about economics, of course, you find out there's enormous differences. If you want to learn more about economics, there's enormous differences. You find out that Galbraith is very different from other people, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And I'm sure Galbraith himself would say he's very different from other people, too. But it's in the areas that he doesn't like, he's not interested in, such as Wonder Bread. I'm sure he was, I'm sure, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that Galbraith would say, just a priori, I'm sure that Galbraith would say that Wonder Bread is the same, same junk as all other bread. Uh, I may as well state another difference here. I'm a big Pepsi fanatic. To most people who don't care about colas one way or the other, who are marginally interested in colas, so then Pepsi and Coke are all the same. To me, of course, they're fantastic differences between Pepsi and Coke. And I could talk about that at length. <laughs> so to the real Pepsi fan, as you, I, I'm sure when I started out, I was a little kid learning about cola, I'm sure I thought it was all the same too. Uh, but it's only when I became a aficionado in the field that I realized that Pepsi is much better. <laughs> so, uh, so rather than these differences being artificially created by advertising and by evil businessmen who have their own brand names, I would say that the businessmen are just starting off uh, tapping the enormous differences that really exist. <clears throat> okay, so what the advertiser has to do he has to inform people of new products. He has to inform people of new prices for the products. He has to inform new generations of consumers of what's going on. He has to remind even older people, even, even veterans, uh, what, of, of the existence of the product, of improvements in the product, and so forth. He ha- he's another, in other words, he's competing for consumer attention. Now, here's another point that anti-advertising people don't, understand, don't seem to understand. Consumers, not only doesn't the consumer have perfect knowledge, Consumer's time is limited. His energy is limited. I mean, there's only a certain number of things that you can do a day, and you're bombarded with different suggestions, plans, uh, proposals, etc. Uh, the function of advertising is trying to call the existence of the product to, your, to, the, to the attention of the consumer, this busy, harassed consumer, and try to say, hey, wait a minute, look, we got, we got this product here, it's really pretty good, and so forth. Think, for example, what the, of, 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 take for example a gas station. There's, a, there's an enormous, of course, anti, enormous amount, of course, of anti-billboard hysteria uh, among intellectuals. But think, for example, you're driving along, and you'd like to have some gas, and if, if you prevent anybody from putting up a sign up there saying, I mean, after all, how are you going to find the gas, the gas station? I mean, unless you have total knowledge of the area, which most drivers don't have, you're not going to find it unless somebody, somebody up, somewhere up there is a sign saying gas with you know, flashing lights or something. And so the function of the advertising sign is to inform the public, call the attention of the public, here's, a, here's some gas available. The anti billboard fanatics who want to, of course, eliminate all signs and billboards would mean that everybody would have a lot of gas breakdowns. Maybe that's what they want. Uh, Professor Kersner, my colleague, has written some very excellent... excellent um, stuff on advertising, uh, points out also that uh, interesting thing of what happened in, in, in NYU where he teaches uh, during the height of the campus revolution, back in the 69-70, the famous uh, campus revolution period, when only the only anti-advertising new left uh, were using the walls, of course, of the NYU as their, as their billboard. <laughs> only anti-billboard types were putting billboards up, wall posters, as that called. And the thing is that as they kept going, they kept competing for consumer attention because obviously the, the, 
the kids were being harassed, there were a lot of riots to go to and so forth. <coughs> a lot of things going on. <coughs> so <coughs> the slogans kept getting punchier and catchier. The signs on the on the on the wall posters began to get bigger and bigger. And began to say, hey, wait a minute, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, comes of uh, they even we use a little bit of, a little bit of fraud in their advertising. Like saying sex, you know, in big letters and say come to the you know, SDS meeting or whatever. So, uh, <coughs> so all the old techniques which they had attacked thoroughly on the commercial front began to be used uh, by the new left because because this, that's what they were doing is the same sort of thing. They're trying to get the consumers of their constituency uh, the attention so they can try to induce them to do something, buy something, go somewhere, or whatever. <coughs> uh, <coughs> as a matter of fact, I think what we see pretty well. This brings us to the famous to the philosophic attack on advertising. We see pretty well that what businessmen are doing desperately, almost, is courting the consumer. Uh, the consumer is the king, the king on the hill. And, and the businessmen are trying desperately to get the consumer's attention, court the consumer, say, buy this product, you'll like it, and so forth and so on. And this seems to me pretty, pretty conclusive evidence in itself that the consumer is not being determined like a push button to, uh, as soon as he sees something, to rush out and buy it. In other words, the whole, the whole atmosphere is completely different. The whole attitude on the part of business matter is not, hey, you go out there and, and buy this product. The whole atmosphere is, wait a minute, stop here, you'll like it, and so forth and so on. Wooing, courting the consumer. Uh, <clears throat> now, if it were true that the consumer was determined by this, this sort of a robot manner, then, for example, there would be no need for, for an enormous, uh, enormously inc- increasing subculture or sub-occupation which most of us don't know much about, called market research. Market research is a big industry. <coughs> and the whole point of market research is devoted to only one thing. That's, a, that's for business now to try to find out desperately in advance, will consumers like this product? Will they like this ad? Test marketing. Uh, the ad, test marketing the product. Trying to find out what kind of product a consumer will like before an enormous amount of money is invested and so forth and so on. Uh, now the point of this is, the point of this almost desperate quest to try to please the consumer in advance, try to find out what he's going to do. Will he like it? Will he not like it? The whole point seems to be pretty clear. The consumer is the king of the walk. The consumer is being wooed and courted, and not, the consumer, not that the consumer is being pushed around like a robot. Because if a businessman could push consumers around like a robot, they certainly wouldn't invest millions in market research. They just put out some product, you know, widgets or yucks or something like that, and say, all right, go out there and buy yucks, and everybody rush out and buy it. No need for market research to find out whether they like yucks in advance. Um, then, of course, there's the, there's the famous flopperoos, which even Galbraith admits, he says these are exceptions which prove the rule. But even he admits that they exi- they've existed. In other words, in cases which don't happen too often, because after all, there is market research for the businessman desperately trying to find out in advance if they're going to lose a lot of money. But cases, there are cases where, after an enormous amount of ballyhoo and publicity and advertising, the product is produced and falls for completely on its, on its face. It flops. There's, of course, the famous case of the Ethel Carr, which is a total flopperoo. There's also the case of Corfan, Corfan shoe, where the idea was, you see, <laughs> the idea was, you see, that there's a new kind of, this new thing, which is better than leather, because it doesn't break in at all. It just stays there like a mold, and your foot breaks in, unfortunately. <laughs> the, <discovery. laughs> the foot caves in, you know, before the, le- the leather, or the Corfan, People didn't like that. People felt people wanted to feel they were in control of the shoe and of the shoe in control of them. The result of which Corfan was also a flopperoo, the Corfan shoe. So <clears throat> these are two heartwarming examples of undetermined consumers, obviously, consumers asserting their uh, their wrath. Uh, <clears throat> the whole determinist argument, as a matter of fact. Just like in all other cases, uh, in all other cases of determinism, I should say, uh, other, there are many instances of ideas of philosophical determinism. Just as in those cases, the same way with advertising, there's always a hidden escape hatch for the determinist. In other words, the assumption always is, you, you, and you out there, you're all determined, but I'm not. Boy, I'm somehow out of it. I'm floating above the crowd, telling all you jerks that you're all determined. <laughs> now, obviously, <laughs> there's something peculiar about this kind of reasoning. Now, if everybody's determined by advertising and brainwashed from an early age and all the rest of it, 
and and they and they say go out and buy uh, Mr. Clean. Everybody rushes out and buys Mr. Clean. If this is really the way things work, how come the Galbraith and every left wing intellectual you ever met, how come they've risen above all this? They're not determined by anything. They don't buy a damn thing, presumably. Uh, they are free floating intellectuals, floating on, on top of levitating above a crowd, and not subject to these determining influences. While well, either they're superheroes and somehow somehow heroically escape this, you know, this miasma, which I somehow doubt, uh, or there ain't no determinism, which I think is the correct the correct solution of this. Uh, I don't think they have any sort of secret secret, you know, Im- immunizing potion that that has uh, prevented them from being determined, determined while all the rest of us have have been uh, ro- robotized. Another point, of course, and I think this is a crucial point, that's the point where the Epsilon and the core fan also, is that on the market, and particularly on the market when we get to advertising, there's a direct feedback or a direct reality test or a direct market test, call it a reality test, of the product. I don't care how much junky advertising you're subjected to. I don't care if you sit there, if the housewife sits there all day and, 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 and Mr. Clean whisks her out of the kitchen. I think it was Mr. Clean. <laughs> You go out and you buy Mr. Clean, you find out. I mean, very quickly, does a giant appear and whisk you out of the kitchen? If not, then either, if you really believe this nonsense, uh, then you have to have an you know, IQ of something like 30. If you really believe that, then you're disillusioned. <laughs> and you realize there's no Mr. Clean, there's no genie that comes suddenly pops up, and all the rest of it, and then you forget about it. I mean, that's the, that's the market test, the reality test of, of uh, you know, puff up, puff up advertising. Uh, <coughs> so you find out. You find out very quickly, as we find out about core fan on your foot and so forth and so on. You find out the radio works. You find out whether the detergent works and all that stuff. You find out by the, the more reality, reality test, the market test, and see if it works or not. So in other words, advertising can only do so much. It can call your attention to something. It might even get you to buy the, the darn thing the first time. But there's always this, this test. You find out if you, get, if you win the girl, if you use Gleam or whatever it is. If you don't, that's it. I mean, you, <laughs> your reality test works. The interesting thing is, there is one area of life, one very large area of life, where neither Galbraith, which neither Galbraith doesn't talk about, and the left liberal intellectuals don't talk about, ever, ever, in connection with advertising. There's one area of life where there is no reality test. There is no direct market test. There's no feedback. There's no nothing. And that's the area somehow, with these, I'd say, these people never criticize advertising in this area. This is political advertising, whole area of government, whole area of politics. If you elect me, my friends, I will do such and such. That sort of advertising. And somehow, the political process, where you can't, you can't find out if Mr. Mr. Clean works, we'll get you out of the kitchen, or if you you win the girl with a gleam and that sort of stuff. Where there's no, there's no direct test, there's no nothing, there's this vague, cloudy promises. Uh, it's in this area where political advertising has full sway. Where people can be sucked into believing stuff which isn't true, uh, and some, but somehow the left liberals never, never, never uh, discuss this problem. <coughs> uh, and this brings us to uh, really brings us to government, the whole question of government vis-à-vis the market, uh, and that connection. <coughs> Okay, and on the mar- one of the you know one of my disagreements, one of my minor areas of disagreement with my mentors in the free market economics, for example, Professor Mises will, will refer to the market as the democracy of the market or the ballot box of the market. I think that's a smear on the market. Uh, I mean, the the, the, the the processes, what happens in so-called democracy is so inferior, as far as I'm concerned, as far as consumer choice goes or feedback or anything of that sort, so inferior to the market that that, 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 they, don't, that they don't really bear comparison at all. Uh, for example, on the market, you buy your product, you buy a Mr. Clean, you try it, you don't buy it anymore, you buy it some more, whatever, you have this direct test. Also, you have complete control of your own individual purchases. I mean, you have your income, and you decide what to purchase, and which things to purchase, and so forth. You can decide to keep buying it or not buy it. Uh, and you have an enormous number of, enormous number of choices. I mean, even, even though a lot of, there's a lot of griping about there should be twice as many automobile companies or something like that. So all in all, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of ways in, in which to spend the consumer dollar. Thousands and thousands and thousands of different entrepreneurs are trying to sell us stuff. 
we have, an, we have an enormous range of choice, and it's a choice that keeps growing, a range that keeps growing all the time. Now let's turn and contrast the government. And here's the market, which is always being attacked as being a monopolist. Right. right. And we turn the government, which is usually being praised as heroic and the democratic and the people's will and all that. In the, in, the, in the field of government, we have a situation where, first of all, we vote, we cast our ballot, not every day for, for Mr. Clean or against Mr. Clean, but every four years, once. Right? Every four years. Uh, at best, <coughs> <coughs> at best, if we really think the majority rules, which is dubious anyway, let's assume for a minute the majority rules, at best then 51% of the people will get their way, but the other 49% are shafted for another four years. In other words, they can't say, well, I don't want Mr. Clean. Uh, they can't say that because, uh, majority is voting for Mr. Clean. Tough. You, you're gonna watch Mr. Clean for four years. Or no, no. Well, we'll know the reason why. Uh, 49% can't opt for his or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> also, in addition to the fact you have a 51% crushing the 49%, you have, a, you have, instead of buying in individual, instead of each individual buying individual things, you have this majority, in quotes, buying the whole complete package. I mean, you like one guy for president, one guy for congressman, etc., and that's it. And he works his will with you for four years. In other words, you're not, you're not, you're not saying, well, I think I like your, I'll vote for your rent policy, but against your foreign policy or whatever. No, no. It's a complete package wrapped up in, whether you, and, you, and when you vote for one guy, you're getting his entire package, period. And there's no way to break this down. In the market, of course, you're buying Mr. Clean, and you're not buying it, you're buying high five sets somewhere else, and not buying them, and so forth. Every individual service is broken down to their individual components. <coughs> and to the individual consumer. Of course, the government is totally different. The government, you have the masses, Collectively buying a pig and a poke, literally. You're buying, it, you're putting one guy in, you're not sure what he's gonna do, there's no, there's lots of fraudulent advertising. When I get in, I will, I will raise expenditures for everything and cut taxes and that sort of stuff and, and I'll end inflation. And after four years, the guy's violated every one, every one of his promises and not, nothing happens to him. He's not sent to jail for fraud. Uh, in fact, he probably gets a pension from the taxpayer <laughs> and live the rest of his life. So, <coughs> so there's no feedback at all. There's no reality test at all. There's a cloudy, vague, vague promises, vaguely, vaguely met, vaguely, re vaguely repudiated. Nobody know, knows what happened. And besides, after four years, who remembers anyway? If you haven't said, if you can't remember what happened two weeks ago with your, your purchase, who's going to remember what the guy did three years ago? Uh, also, in addition to that, <clears throat> on the market, despite the usual uh, approach of monopoly, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there are thousands upon thousands of choices of firms, businesses to, to buy from. In politics and government, there's only two: a duopoly. We have what's known as a giant duopoly: Democratic Party and Republican Party. A couple of minor parties who don't amount to much. Uh, and these two parties. Not only are there only two parties, but everybody loves this. Every liberal political scientist, if you ever take a course in political science, what a wonderful thing we have, with the glorious two-party system. You ever hear talk about a glorious two-firm system? No? That's, that's terrible. It'd be evil and monopolistic. <coughs> if, there only, if there are only three firms in the automobile industry, everybody thinks that the world has come to an end. But it's okay to have two firms in the entire government apparatus, and only two. And of course, when you have a duopoly, as classical economics shows, you tend to have collusion. There are only two guys, why not? So there's a collusive duopoly. When Democrats and Republicans sound very much alike, and their promises are very much the same, and then what do you do? Where, where is our choice then? I mean, we have no choice whatsoever. Uh, so the, uh, this wonderful Democratic choice, which we're offered every four years, is a choice between one, one fraud and another fraud, each of which are pushing almost the same ideology, the slight differences in rhetoric in order to differentiate the, in order to differentiate the product artificially a little bit. And so here's where the, only attack on monopoly, <clears throat> on differentiated product, on collusion, on, uh, on, on concentration of size, on lack of choices, all that sort of stuff, all this stuff really applies to government. And yet somehow the liberal economist never, never applies to the government, never. Even right-wing economists don't apply to the government. No place you get this kind of analysis. Somehow government is sacrosanct, you see. Uh, not, not, uh, you, can't, you don't apply ordinary standards uh, to it. <clears throat> That's why I say that when you say the market is democratic, you're really smearing the market. Uh, 
Well, let's take the uniform uniformity of 51%. Let's, let's take a specific example, which at least until a year or two, a year or two or three ago, was a hallowed example in American life, and any criticism of it was considered the equivalent of criticizing motherhood and apple pie. Of course, motherhood is sort of under attack now, and I don't know about apple pie. <laughs> hey, right. It's now sort of almost legitimate to criticize the public school system. Uh, let's take the public school system. You have a, here's a system run by the taxpayers, let's say, run by the majority of each area. Well, you have to have some kind of, here you have this product. You have to run it in some way, public school. And there has to be a decision. There's all sorts of important decisions to make. Should it be traditional education? Should it be progressive? Should it be some combination of the two? Should it be sex education? Should it be religious education? Should it be push capitalism or socialism? And you have dozens of different very important questions to be decided. And the point is, whatever the decision is, and usually the decision will be bland, <coughs> centrist, and you know, not, not the annoying too many people. That would be the usual bureaucratic majority kind of decision. <coughs> the point is, once the decision is made, that's it. There's no room for dissent, uh, not, uh, getting out from under the uniformity, etc. Whereas, the private education, when the parents and children are in control, consumers are in control, then there, instead of being one type of public school which is imposed on the, on the whole country, uh, or the whole area, a robot-like, you have all sorts of different, different groups of parents, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll set up and sponsor different kinds of schools. You have, you'll have Christian schools, parochial schools, secular schools, progressive, traditional, left-wing, right-wing, etc., etc., and the consumers then will determine uh, what kind of school they want. So instead of having a, a uniform, centrist uh, kind of uh, uniformity imposed on the top, uh, with a market you have an enormous, an enormous range, a wide range of diversity. Uh, and uh, diversity is like covering a whole spectrum of what people are interested in and willing to pay for. And there's again a difference between the government in action and private individuals in action on the market. <clears throat> because the market really means voluntary action. That's, that's really the result of voluntary action. Uh, take, for example, another educational, this is one of my favorite uh, examples on the educational front. Because education doesn't only mean schooling, obviously. We learn things all the time. And one of the ways in which we learn things is newspapers and magazines. Uh, now, if, it's <coughs> if we should have public schools, and we should also have, it seems to me, public newspapers and magazines. And can, you imagine, can you imagine the kind of, kind of magazine that would come out? Can you imagine the kind of newspaper that would, come, that would emerge from, from, a, from a government bureau, you know, bureaucratic handling of it? Can you imagine how monstrous it would be? Can you imagine how dull? <laughs> can you imagine what a pain in the neck? Who would read it? Obviously nobody would read it, but the taxpayers would kick in for it. Uh, <coughs> can you imagine, for example, it would be interesting decisions would be made. Supposing... Supposing, um, how will they decide how to allocate their space? There's a scarce amount of space uh, for any newspaper, any magazine. How will they decide who gets, in, who gets into it? Should they have this left winger in it? Should they have a right winger in it? How do they decide this? And of course, every decision becomes a political decision since the taxpayers are supposed to pay for this. And so they will wind up with the blandest cap you can possibly imagine. <coughs> I would not be writing for this government newspaper. It's pretty clear, even if I wanted to. Okay, so... The result of this, of course, is, is a stifling the result of government education, whether it's schools or newspapers or magazines, is a stifling of any kind of independent thought, any kind of criticism, any kind of, any kind of opposition to the status quo. This is what public schools, of course, inevitably become. They become the, the, <coughs> the engineers of consent, <coughs> engineers of general public support for the status quo, for the government itself. It's inevitable, regardless of how they even start out that to found the public school system. And if we get back, interestingly enough, if we get back to the origins of the public school system in this country or abroad, we find out that the origins were precisely that. That the people then were much franker than they are now, and they were, the origins were specifically to mold the public into the general, uh, general government uh, uh, way of thinking, obedience to the government, obedience to the powers that be. In the case of uh, the United States, the first public schools were in New England, Massachusetts, in Puritan Massachusetts, the idea is to mold the public and to mold each little kid into the Puritan framework. Every kid becomes a, you know, steadfast, ardent Puritan. 
And that was, that was, uh, they, had, they made no bones about it. They were very frank and open about it. They, the object of, of education, schools, was to indoctrinate, to shape the characters, everybody becomes a Puritan. Uh, there was no democratic uh, patina, so we say, surrounding the public school system in the old days. <coughs> in addition to <coughs> that problem, this, this of course, uh, relates to, in general, the whole problem of education and the whole problem of use of resources, government, which we'll get to later, too. Uh, in addition to this, the, there's also involved in the attack on advertising a monstrous assault on free speech. Interestingly enough, the civil libertarians were very uh, happy on civil liberties in some areas somehow lose their voice when they get to, for example, cigarette advertising on television. It seems to me cigarette advertising on television is a form of speech, a form of, of expression, and yet the government has outlawed it with no, no, as far as I can see, no reaction whatsoever, no, no complaint, no griping from the American Civil Liberties Union, no nothing. Uh, <coughs> I, I see, I, as far as I'm concerned, liberties are, are, are under direct attack when, when cigarette advertising is outlawed. Uh, if we're going to say that Somehow it's fraudulent because you're not being told at all times that you're going to get lung cancer from cigarette advertising or whatever. Uh, if, if, we, if we can say that we should outlaw all fraudulent advertising, I mean, this, this, this brings up an interesting point. If you're really going to outlaw all fraudulent advertising, all advertising is not going to meet its, somehow its uh, promises, what are we going to do about campaigners? What are we going to do about government? What are we going to do about all these politicians? Do we outlaw them? Well, I'm almost tempted to say yes. <laughs> It's only my devotion of free speech that prevents. I'd, I'd sooner outlaw you know, political advertising than I would uh, cigarette advertising. So that way, it's much more fraudulent. Uh, and yet, somehow, nobody advocates outlawing that. <laughs> uh, then, of course, we get into other, even touchier areas. Ish. What about uh, Professor Galbraith, for example, in his books? Uh, some of us would, would say it's fraudulent to call it economics. <laughs> <coughs> Do we then give the government to decide the power <coughs> of saying what's, e what's really economic and what isn't? And anything which is not is really be outlawed as being fraudulent. You see there are a lot of sticky areas here when you start outlawing uh, instruments of expression. There's a, also on the advertising front, and it's sort of basic again to the attack on advertising by Galbraith, in his famous book, The Affluent Society, which is one of my least favorite books of all time. <laughs> one of these things, hmm? The Affluent Society by Galbraith. It was his first great bestseller. It came out in 1959. Uh, <coughs> he talks there, it was an assault on affluence. People are too affluent. Capitalism is evil because too, we're too affluent. That was before they found out the capitalism was evil because we were too poverty stricken. That was about <laughs> three years before that. <laughs> this is the anti-affluence gig. At any rate, in there he talks about, see the problem is that these, these brainwashed wants, these things which we, we are induced to purchase, such as Wonder Bread or Pepsi or whatever, these are artificial wants, he calls them, artificial wants. And, and there's this very strong implication in, in Galbraith now, artificial wants means that they're illegitimate, they're improper, they're, they should not be expressed. <coughs> this, is a, this is a contrast, presumably, to natural wants. Now, what are natural wants? This is about left pretty vague. It seems to me pretty, if, if, he, if he says it, it really does say that artificial wants are wants that are either that are found, are discovered from other people, learned of from advertising or from friends or whatever. Now, if you really say that, you're really outlawing practically everything except uh, pure, you know, sort of, sort of caveman kind of kind of wants, like, you know, sort of, sort of, uh, uh, chewing up the meat. They sort of basically just, just pure subsistence. Everything, everything above pure subsistence, pure primitive subsistence, then, is dismissed by Galbraith as being artificial. It's a peculiar kind of philosophic, uh, system he's got there. <coughs> uh, why is it artificial? Why is it evil or artificial, improper to learn about wants from other people? After all, people, uh, uh, human beings are not animals. We don't learn about stuff through instincts. We can only learn about stuff 
either from our own experience or from other people's experience. And so we learn about wants. <coughs> just, which, this is what I like to learn about te- techniques. And we learn about wants from uh, other people, from uh, friends, neighbors, or whatever. And this is really the process of what civilization is all about in many ways. The fact that we're influenced by other people and we learn about things from other people, you try to outlaw this, it seems to me you're really outlawing the human condition altogether. There are very few people, you know, who can create their own wants de novo, sort of out of thin air, without consulting anything else, experience, or any other person. If it's ever been done, it's pretty unusual, to say the least. I doubt whether Galbraith even has done it. Uh, and in the learning process, again, I talked about the learning process before, the learning process also includes the process of learning about what's going on. Learning, I mean, you learn about TV sets, for example, because the first guy in the town buys a TV set when it first comes out. You go and look at it, hey, it looks terrific, and you want to buy it yourself. This, this process of diffusion of uh, new consumer products is very similar to the diffusion of producers' products. Incidentally, uh, Hayek and DeJuvenel both written some very interesting stuff, uh, which egalitarians have always, have always stuck in egalitarians' throats. Justifications for differences of wealth and income on the basis of learning how to consume. In other words, the first guy... The wealthy guy in town buys the first TV set. And he, and he buys it because it's, you know, since not too many TV sets have come out yet. It's pretty expensive. He buys it and he, hey, this is terrific. Everybody learns about it. And then this, then the, the knowledge of the consumption spreads and the consumers, you know, a mass market opens up and more people buy it. So eventually everybody has a TV set. So in other words, the wealthy people have a, perform an important social function of pioneering in consumption. Puffs <laughs> <laughs> don't like that. <coughs> that approach, I think it's correct. Uh, <coughs> again, pointing out, <coughs> there's always a first a person for everything. There's always a first creator of inventions or production or production or new products. There's also a, for, always a first consumer of, of everything. First guy who goes out and gets a, gets a TV set. First guy has his own private helicopter or whatever. Uh, <coughs> Interestingly enough, Galbraith is attacking in this book, The Affluent Society, which I'd say is one of my banes, one of the banes of my existence. Uh, <coughs> he's attacking these artificial wants constantly throughout the book. And then when, he, when he's, he's uh, talking about his solution of the problem, his solution is we, what we need, he says, is a vast multi-billion dollar program of federal, using federal funds to educate people so they can change their consumption so they can do the right things like listening to Bach or reading his books or whatever, whatever it is. <coughs> but for some reason, these things are not artificial. Listening to, doing the sort of things that Galbraith wants you to do, like drinking fine wine or listening to Bach or reading Galbraith or watching, God forbid, Channel 13 all your life. <laughs> Public television goes that time in New York. Uh, <coughs> or listening to uplift kind of lectures all the time. But this sort of activity is somehow not artificial, but somehow on, on, on the same plane as, as raw existence. Well, just one of the, the many contradictions in the Albright, that's one of the things that, as I say, sticks in my core to this day. Oh, we have, uh, I should say just a word here, but a very, a very lengthy topic. I just want to say a couple of words on it. It's the sort of thing that can be talked about for weeks. That's the whole relationship between the market and ethics. I've been talking about how Galbraith, what Galbraith really wants to do is to change people, people's consumption, consumption patterns. What he's really saying is, is it's somehow unethical to buy Pepsi and buy Coke and buy Wonder Bread, but it's ethical to listen to Bach and buy Galbraith's uh, volumes. That's, that's his implicit position. Uh, now I can see how uh, the point about the market is, or the free market, is that it, it leaves the, the public, the individuals uh, on the market, free to uh, follow their own values, to follow their own ethics, to buy whatever they want to buy, uh, and uh, <coughs> they follow their own codes. The, uh, now you can say, if you want to, that some of their purchases are unethical from some position, some other position. Uh, what I'm saying is that you should try to persuade the person uh, if you want, uh, that is an unethical purchase, 
rather than outlaw it. That was the difference here is between coercion and persuasion. Uh, oddly enough, Galbraith is very, very upset about the persuasion involved in advertising and the persuasion involved in market kind of uh, selling costs, etc. He's not upset at all about coercive, coercive actions of the federal government to force people to listen to Bach or to do whatever. Somehow that's okay. That's not brainwashing. That's not, uh, <clears throat> that's not artificial. Uh, I think though that I, I, I think you can say, uh, if you want to, that certain categories of purchases are unethical. Uh, but it's, it's kind of difficult to say that, for example, a lot of, a lot of people say that it's un, uh, we, sh- we, we're, we're spending too much on cosmetics. Sort of a common charge. America spent too much on cosmetics. We should spend less on cosmetics and more on bubble gum or whatever the alternative is. Well, the thing is, I, I, it's very, I, I don't know of any ethical system which can grind out or crank out a quantitative conclusion like that. What's the optimal, what's the ethical optimum cosmetics purchase? I don't know. I don't think anybody else does either. Uh, if you, you can try to make the case that cosmetics are evil and should be abandoned altogether. I wouldn't agree with it, but that's, that's, a, that's a possible case. But to say that it should be 10% less purchase on cosmetics than there are now, I don't know how anybody can really back this up. I've not, not yet heard of any, anybody set forth a, quant, a system of quantitative ethics. Uh, <clears throat> and yet there's a lot of the ethical criticism of the market of this sort of this kind of peculiar kind of quantitative ethics. Uh, there's also, of course, in this connection, there's the there's a familiar uh, less intellectual critique of so-called materialism. Uh, the people, the market, uh, the market forces are too materialistic. Somehow encourage materialism. Actually, uh, I don't know what sense it gets, it gets to get uh, vague about what sense the person is talking about materialism. If uh, if you mean concern with purely physical objects or physical consumption or something like that, then it's really the reverse of the truth because in the primitive period when you're, everybody's on mere subsistence level, everybody's spending all of his time scratching out food. Nobody ain't got time to talk about, to think about economics, philosophy or anything of that sort or high culture. High culture only becomes possible when there's a certain surplus uh, standard of living. When the standard of living gets to the, to the point where people have the leisure to begin concentrating on other things. Uh, secondly, <coughs> uh, the peculiar thing about this materialism attack is, and for example, somebody, uh, somebody will say, this guy is making a uh, terrible thing, this guy's making a lot of money because he's, produ- he's writing stuff that the public likes, it's too commercial, it's too materialistic, and he's making millions out of it, whereas I was a great novel, making practically nothing. Well, it seems to me he should glory in this. Shouldn't be, shouldn't be griping about it. If he's really against materialism and money and commerce, then the fact that he's making nothing out of it should be a great joy to him. Somehow it isn't. <coughs> somehow the conclusion from this is, from this, our, our anti-materialist is, that somehow the other guy's material should be taken away from him and handed over to him, the anti-materialist. Well, then is more deserving of these material goodies. And it seems to me an inner contradiction by the anti-materialist. And it's always sort of the implicit conclusion to all this, that somehow either the government should take, tax the, the uh, commercial people and give it over, hand it over to the anti-materialists or whatever. That seems to me a big contradiction there. Uh, well, another thing I wanted to say about <coughs> government advertising and public advertising and all that is that uh, public service commercials, for example, on television, Strike me as being fantastically dull, 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 dullzaville. Even if they're not government, even if they're just some, you know, a, a, a beloved public agent, a, pri- a private voluntary agency, they are dull. And probably the, the, the most imaginative of them turns out to be a complete fraud. That's a good, our old pal Smokey the Bear. Now it turns out that Smokey the Bear has been peddling fraud for all those years on television because the, there's a split, you see, among the conservationists and environmentalists, which has just, just surfaced recently. And that is that all this hysteria about forest fires turns out, turns out to be a bad thing because forest fires are really good. See, the small-scale natural forest fires, we don't have the government rushing to every forest fire and stamping it out immediately. Uh, we have sort of natural forest fires that clears away the underbrush, that makes the pine cones hot, 
And so the pine trees can then re, you know, refurbish themselves and all that. You can see I'm a little hazy on the technological point. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> but my close friends in the, the nature field tell me this is true. Uh, and <clears throat> then they can refurbish themselves and all that. But now you see what's happened is since they stamp, the government comes in and stamps out every forest fire, helped by Smokey the Bear as a theoretician of this. Uh, they, they don't give a chance for natural forest fires to grow, and the pine trees don't grow, and there's too much underbrush, and then a big forest fire comes and, you know, and, and strikes down the whole forest, forest as a result. So the government messes everything up all, always, regardless of what area it's involved in, even Smokey the Bear, seemingly harmless uh, kind of thing there.